I will talk about two subjects. One is transmembrane proteins and one is something totally different that will also not be part of your exam. Let's begin with a brief introduction to membrane protein and membrane structure prediction. Uh, again, so there is no lecture next Tuesday and the lecture on the 19th will be skipped. I'm going to ask again after the recap of secondary, on secondary structure prediction about suggestions for the uh, exam. Again, sequence, uniquely determined structure, proteins thrown into solvent adopt a unique three-dimensional structure. For sequences of proteins that are very similar, we can align them and identify similarity in structure. Then there is just the daylight zone, the twilight zone, we need sequence profile alignment, profile profile alignment in the midnight zone. We can predict the structure for about one third of all the known proteins through comparative modeling where we pick an experimental structure and simply say, after we identify this structure to be the similar one, that the structure is identical to the one that I have in the database. That for the remaining roughly two thirds of the story, I will get back to the contact prediction. That would be great if we could do that. We cannot. Uh, but we can clearly do 1D prediction and secondary structure prediction is one example for that. The first example that I chose uh, is stabilized by hydrogen bonds. Helix, Peter Strand, same thing. Backbone hydrogen bonds. And the first generation of methods simply used single residue probabilities, got to some relatively low performance. The second used the context probability. Uh, the problems were that we did not get right much over 60% performance, that beta strands were predicted very badly and that the seconds are too short, machine learning device, neural network. And again, in this particular example, there's not a single example of a method that uh, has survived nearest neighbor, by the way, is another example that is very, very good. K-mer nearest neighbor kind of tools are very good. The more data you already have in the database. So in principle, they should become better over time, but this again has survived. Maybe it's historic reasons. I don't actually for this particular case know. <coughs> but the major breakthrough really comes from using instead of a single vector uh, the evolutionary information that pushes and here's a couple of tools that I show. The latest one here is Porter. Uh, again, based on the system of neural networks. Cypred, based on neural networks. And ProfSec, PhD, all based on neural networks. Uh, the overall accuracy now moved from something like 60% to over 80%. And this number increases because the databases grow. Uh, it's good prediction for beta strand and good prediction of the segment length. Let's now go to the transmembrane helix story, which is again is a feature of secondary structure, but it's a slightly different feature of secondary structure. Now, it's the same feature of secondary structure, I, I, it just in the prediction context is a different one. So now imagine you, you have a cell. In the cell you have liquid, and you have all kinds of you have, uh, DNA, you have proteins that, that work in there. How do you protect the cell? What can you put around it? Think about this. If you were an engineer, they want to protect this, this, this bag of aggregates. Let's just imagine it's, it's expensive gold that is swimming in there or an electrolyte or what, whatever. You, electrolyte is a bad example. Um, but there's something swimming in there and you want to protect it. So what we typically do when we run around today, we have plastic bags. Plastic bags for a cell don't work because what's the problem with the plastic? Well, plastic was not invented in nature. That, that, that is not the answer I'm looking for. It could have been. So why, why can we not use a plastic bag to protect a cell? Because they're watertight. It's tight. Yeah, watertight is what I want, right? No, I don't. I still need some activity with the outside environment. That's the important point, right? You, have to, you need absolute exchange. Cells, in some sense, breathe. They constantly exchange with the environment. So you need something that, in contrast to a plastic bag, is permeable, and permeable in both directions. You need something to come in and something to get out. So since you have inside water, the idea of putting a sort of lipid around this is clear, because lipid protects the liquid inside. Uh, now you put a double layer of lipids. That's the cell membrane. Just two short movies, this time from Roshni Nelson, originally at Southwestern. Now she... The cell membrane controls traffic into and out of the cell that surrounds. 
like all biological membranes, the cell membrane exhibits selective permeability. That is, it allows some substances to cross it more easily than others. This ability of the cell to discriminate in its chemical exchanges with its environment is fundamental to life, and it is the cell membrane that makes this selectivity possible. In this video, you will learn about the structure of membranes and how the outermost membrane of a eukaryotic cell, the cell membrane or plasma membrane, controls the passage of substances. However, the same general principles of membrane traffic also apply to the many varieties. Oh, I can't. This form of barrier that separates the inside of the cell from the outside of the cell. The phospholipids are arranged. So that's the lipid bilayer, right? Lipid bilayer. A pure phospholipid bilayer will allow a very limited number of substances to pass through. Water can diffuse across because it is so small, but this is a slow process. Each phospholipid is made up of a phosphate group and two fatty acid tails. The hydrocarbon tails are non-polar, unable to bond with water, and are hydrophobic, hydro, water, phobic, fear. The polar phospholipid head has an affinity for water, and thus is hydrophilic. When phospholipids are added to water, they form assemblies that shield their hydrophobic portions from the water. See here the formation of a lipid monolayer. Anyway, so I, I, I try to interrupt and, and show you the protein, and then I move the movie on. It uh, gives you the principal idea. So, uh, a prokaryotic cell essentially has, in principle, only one membrane around. Some of them have two, but both of them are outside membranes. And the eukaryotic mem cell has many membranes inside. In some sense, you could argue that the evolutionary invention of the eukaryotic cell is to, in fact, incorporate other cells inside the cell. So the nucleus is one, and they are also membrane-bound compartments. And for the f complexity of the functioning of the eukaryotic cell, this system is very crucial. The membranes outside and inside in the eukaryote, they differ. The environments differ. But essentially, they are all lipid bilayers. Okay? That's the way they, in, in which they look similar. Now, when we look at drug targets, so drugs are small molecules. They are much, much, much smaller than in protein. Protein typically is many thousands of atoms. Drugs are tens of atoms. Uh, and what you see is that the vast majority of all the proteins by subcellular localization that are targeted by drugs are membrane proteins. Why could that be? Any idea? Well, again, so the cell has to constantly exchange. At the gate of this exchange, you have an easy access and control point. But that, in fact, is also a cell by itself. Many of the diseases that you have come from the outside, are foreign. So this is a way to sort of avoid this intake. That's one reason. The other reason is much, much simpler. That's where the drug can act. It's very easy to sort of link a drug to something that is on the membrane because that's the first point of entry, that's the first point of attack for a virus and for a drug. Membrane proteins, this, the crucial co communication is one of the, the most important ones, that much is clear. And actually several of these here, this is still sort of membrane related and several of these are in some way also membrane related or at the gate, at the, at the onset of the the mechanism of the uh, import. So there is a drug, there is a set of drugability rules. Let's not get into them. But they tend to be uh, found in membranes, cytoplasm, or in the extracellular space. The background on the helices. Here are some. So membrane proteins that sit in the membranes come in two species. They come either as the part that's in the membrane, being all, al all alpha helices, or all beta. I've shown you in my lecture many, many proteins that mix alpha and beta, strands and helices. Membrane proteins, at least the way we know them today, do not do that. 
Many people have tried to sort of find the first protein in the membrane that mixes these two worlds. We haven't found one. The predominant class of membrane proteins are proteins that cross the membrane with all of, with the alpha helices. And you may have to imagine the membrane to be orthogonal here. So one lipid of the lipid bilayer faces in that direction and one lipid of uh, faces in this direction. These two lines here essentially make up the lipid and is orthogonal to that lipid. It sticks in. In the, in the movie when I, when I tried to stop you saw this sort of light blue V forming big big insert into the membrane. That was a channel. Uh, and that is exactly how they, they sit in there. And in most of these cases what you see this mushroom kind of structure. So that typically is the part that is outside the membrane. While these helices, these more colored ones here, are the parts that are inside the membrane. Some of you may be now if, uh, good enough at p uh, picking secondary structure to see this is a beta strands. I said they do not mix uh, beta strands and alpha helices. Alpha helices, beta strand. Well, what I meant is in the membrane region. Okay? So many membrane proteins have something that is the region that goes with alpha helices. Let, let my finger be the alpha helices. And in most of these cases they are pretty much orthogonal to the membrane as you see. And then there is something else attached to it a global region inside or outside or sometimes both. Uh, so here is another example of these. Uh, let me quickly go through this. Um, let me, now the major part of this part here, so I said that Membrane proteins are not really like secondary structure prediction, which is completely wrong because they are membrane helices. Uh, and now this part here is going to go into why did I say that? So that really is a statement that has more to do with the prediction. Remember, I showed you the circle for our power in comparative modeling. How much of the structures can we do by comparative modeling? For membrane proteins, that's this little blue thing. Remember I showed you how for proteins, if we just wait long enough, our power and comparative modeling increases. Well, as you clearly see, that's not the case for membrane proteins. Any idea why that could be the case? Every time we, we find a new structure for uh, membrane protein, it's something completely new. That's a great idea. Uh, and in fact, so <laughs> the last five years have really brought a new improvement of, of in, in structural elimination for membrane proteins. And very much of what you say has become has come true. We didn't believe that this would tr be true as much as it has turned out to be true. Uh, however, the major reason here is a different one. Comparative modeling that I show here the power is always I have to find a protein of known structure that I can relate to my protein, right? So I essentially look up similarity, so I start with the target, I find a template, a structure of experiment, a protein of experimentally known structure that is sequence similar. When they are sequence similar, I say this one has the same structure as that one. For membrane proteins, I do not have many structures in the database. That's the simple reason for this one. And the reason why, why I don't is because they are very complicated to do structures of. One reason for that now is that they are stabilized sitting in this lipid bilayer. In this lipid bilayer, in, if I want to take them out, remember in order to do cr structure determination, crystallography, you had to sort of concentrate your protein to form really, a, to grow a crystal, high concentration. For the membrane proteins, you have to first get them out of the membrane. And that's when they unfold and you can no longer sort of keep them stable. That is one of the big problems. You have to change the environment. It's very, very tricky to in fact try to crystallize them in some sort of lipid. That's one way in which people do it. That's the way they succeed, but it's just much, much more complicated. So what we want to do when we predict membrane structure is on the one hand we want to say that the helix started that residue here from here to here. 
I don't really mind so much about how this global or the non-membrane regions here, these little uh, circles, look. What I do mind about is where is the beginning and the end of that helix and what's the orientation. So is my, my first residue, as in this example here, inside? And in fact, that is the way the sequence goes. Or here, it's the same thing. Oh, I don't have another example. Um, um, wait, that, that's the outside. Wait, here, here the end term is in the inside. Sorry, that, that one uh, starts here and goes this way. I didn't read my annotation right. And uh, this one is the other way around. Uh, so which way are they oriented? Is the helix like that or like that? Okay, That's, those are the first two things that I want to predict. When I do the prediction and I do use the tools that I showed you before, again, we have membrane helices. They are just, if you look at the structure of a membrane helix, I take them out and I showed you some of these examples, they just look like every other helix in a protein. This, however, is what the prediction does to them. So the, these, these prediction methods that I just showed you in the recap now, that reach 80% accuracy for membrane proteins, they reach something like this. So totally wrong. They completely miss this membrane helix and believe that there is a beta strand. And there are sort of physical reasons, or biophysical reasons, why that is the case. Um, now, um, by the way, here's, here's another example of a reason. So, the reasons why you have membrane proteins is one, you transfer a signal from, from one end of the molecule by conformational changes. Another one, you really form a gate. So, the potassium channel here, where the potassium really slides through, the gate can open or close. And this way, molecule by mo molecule really passes through that gate. It's an active gating. Active means you have to bind something before the gate opens. Typically, these are triggered by, by sugar or ATP uh, or GTP. Here's another mechanism for which you, have, you need a membrane protein. So you have here a protein that's attached to the membrane, shown with one helix. This is one helix. And here's another one. And then you form something that people refer to as long coiled coils. I, sh I showed you visually a couple of times these long sort of fingers, and you see them. So they are intertwined. Just uh, imagine that you, you have uh, some wire that you uh, intertwine like that, and by that these two hands hold together. And that's exactly the mechanism for connecting cells, fusing cells. So they're proteins that essentially form like this long wire. Sometimes you see that, or you may all have used it. I used it this morning to, to close my garden gate. Uh, it's the same idea, it's the same mechanism. Long, as you see, very long ones, they don't have any other purpose than to bring these two things together. And you can also see if you started from far away and then you wound further, you, the cells would really approach slowly. So you could see the other cell already like that, then you wind around each other and the more you wind, the closer these two membranes become and then they possibly could, for instance, fuse. Um, so the point is that the lipid has a structure. That movie already showed you, hydrophobic, hydrophilic. Hydrophilic is you want to be close to water or solvent. Uh, hydrophobic, you want to sort of be inside. The inside of the lipid is hydrophobic. That, you may remember, I briefly discussed, inside of a protein, you have a lot of hydrophobic residues often cause a hydrophobic effect. So hydrophobic residues, amino acids with hydrophobic side chains want to st stay next to each other. It's energetically favorable. A protein is surrounded by solvent. That means the ones on the surface shouldn't be hydrophobic. They should actually like water, not fear water. Uh, so they're hydrophilic. And that creates something where inside of a protein you have hydrophobic residues, outside hydrophilic. In the membrane, you have the opposite. Because outside you have lipids, so the residues outside have to be hydrophobic. And very often inside you want to gate something. Very often, in fact, there are hydrophobic, tend to be more hydrophilic residues at the inside. Uh, shown here, looked from the top, there's also a charge difference, a polarization of the 
part that goes through the membrane. Uh, the other part, by the way, the, I said the orientation of the helix is something that we want to predict. That is often referred to as the topology for membrane helical proteins. Hydrophobic side chains are, there are different ways of, of, of looking at that, and that is the next part. Uh, alanine, whatever. There are some, again, for the exam, I don't want you to learn the name of these amino acids, but it is important to distinguish between hydrophobicity, hydrophilic and hydrophobic. The green ones here are often categorized, categorized as hydrophobic. That brings us back to a scale. And one of the first scales came from David Eisenberg. Here is essentially the number, so this is the amino acid, and there's a number that is sorted by the degree of hydrophobicity, ranked the top, and so forth, and so on. Now, when I colored this in green before, essentially what I did is I sort of put a value here where I put a threshold and said, if that is higher than something, I call it hydrophobic. But the scale immediately tells you this is a simplification, right? The real thing is the degree. And there's really, you can put a line wherever you want. But one thing is clear, there is nothing that really completely stands out as the point to put the line. Undoubtedly, those things are way more hydrophobic than those. That's clear. But if you want a binary system here, it's not clear whether there is no jump anywhere here at the numbers, if you look at the numbers. Maybe you could say it's here. Uh, and that happens to be a point where some people put it. Uh, maybe you say, well, we point past the zero line. But then the difference is not that high. Difficult to say. So what I look at here is different hydrophobicity scales. The one that I showed you before is in green. Uh, and there are two others. There's another very early one, Kai Doolittle here. Uh, and what I show is essentially the value for each one of these scales. Do they agree? So there are different ways of looking at this. You could argue that for the case of, well, pick whatever you want, uh, scale, and look at the top contenders. Uh, I don't know, the top five or top six. And then you may suddenly f see there is some agreement. So clearly, I saw everybody here reacting in the same way. When we look at the bars, they are not of equal height. That we all see immediately, right? They, they differ. But there are some tendencies. And if you translated it to the binary system, you could imagine that they would not be that far off. Trouble is, when we come with more hydrophobicity scales, and actually, you know, typically, when, when you do research and you see something like that, you believe you can do better. So that's the answer to believing to you can do better a couple of more scales here. And in fact, those are very reasonable scales here, and they make a lot of sense. Uh, projected slightly differently here. Again, you see differences. Now here is an early work uh, from, yeah, now almost 17 years ago, Kanesha, to me in Kanesha. And what they did, essentially they clustered 180 different hydrophobicity indices. There is no clustering. So the reason why I make this point here is what I described to you is something that is very clear. Mem lipids are hydrophobic or a, one, a hydrophobic environment and they attract hydrophobic residues. So when a protein passes the membrane, it has to be hydrophobic. Very clear. When I want to measure that in detail and in the experimental detail, and all of these scales are not theoretical scales, they're experimentally measured scales. And they essentially try to measure exactly this effect in some way or other. They don't agree with each other, but still the effect is true. In some sense it's a puzzle. In some sense the statement here is hydrophobicity is a good way of thinking about the problem, but it's not good enough if I write it down as sort of a pseudo-energy. It doesn't have the scaling features. And simply put, because there is unclarity what the signal really is. If I try to pull something out of the membrane, and that is my scale, or I pull something out of water, and that is my scale, those are the same effects somehow, or flip sides of the same effects, but they give very different scales. And not just one minus the other. 
They don't correlate. Because there, the problem actually is more complicated than that. Uh, let's get back to this story here, the big miss prediction. Hydrophobicity scales, simple hydrophobicity scales, and I'm sorry, I should have uh, colored this in uh, red. Get the prediction here right. So the sort of advanced signal structure prediction method that I described about for globular proteins, for proteins that are not in the membrane, get it very, very often very right and way better than this sort of thing because this is like a single residue feature in some sense. And I told you this is 80% accurate, this is 50% accurate, there's a big, big difference. But for membrane proteins, this works and that doesn't. Okay? So we have to do something better than that. And Um, and that's something better I leave to another time. <laughs>